I mean, a lot of you are deeply engaged in the topic of our last book, of A Path of Tears, and uh, so uh, uh, you know, I'd love to get your uh, thoughts about it as well. People tend to be curious uh, how it is that uh, uh, my wife and co-author, that Cheryl and I, ended up writing a book about how to make a difference, how to impact the world, and in part it was maybe for one reason that some of you got engaged. We have three kids. We were trying to get them more engaged, be more empathetic citizens, and of course everybody knows that if you try to tell teenagers, you know, oh, you should do this, then it's going to not work terribly well. Um, so we were exploring what would work to make them uh, more, you know, involved, uh, more empathetic, and so we tried various things. We tried bringing them along with us on our reporting trips. Given the places that I go, that was sometimes a little bit awkward. Uh, I remember one time I had my daughter when she was in the eighth grade uh, with me in Honduras when I was writing about gang-controlled slums. And don't, please, if you're with Child Protective Services, you know, don't, don't spread the word. <laughs> um, we had just gone through one really kind of hairy checkpoint and uh, got through it, breathed a sigh of relief, and I said to Caroline, you know, boy, just, I was trying to reassure her, I said, you know, look, in just a couple more days, we'll be in rural Nicaragua. And she looked at me and he said, Dad, when my friends go on vacation, <laughs> they go to the Caribbean. So actually, Cheryl and I then decided that she had a point. Our next family vacation, we arranged to take all three kids with us uh, on a great uh, Caribbean holiday over Thanksgiving. Uh, Terrific time in Haiti during the cholera outbreak. Uh, <laughs> so you do what you can, you know, you do what you can. Um, and one indication that maybe some of this was actually having a little bit of impact came when my kids got me the best Father's Day present ever. And we've been trying to figure out how we could incorporate giving into our family life a little bit. And we've been talking about innovation in philanthropy and in, uh, in, in the world of giving back, and I want to show you a picture of my Father's Day present. <laughs> this is the most macho He-Man Father's Day present you can imagine. This is a giant Gambian pouched rat, three feet long, nose to tail. Um, I've uh, released a few here, so you can take a look at them as they as <laughs> they go by. Now, they have a they have very weak eyesight, but they compensate with an excellent sense of smell. And so they've been trained uh, by healthcare NGOs to do a couple of things. One is to sniff out landmines uh, and clear minefields, and the other is to uh, sniff out tuberculosis and serve as a diagnostic uh, 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 approach for, for TB. And uh, so... Earlier, so I never actually took physical possession of my rat. Earlier this year, though, I did go to Angola to see how my rat was doing, um, clearing minefields. Um, and this is a wonderful example, one of the things that I think really has happened in the world of um, trying to make a difference, and that is this boom in, in innovation that is partly spawned by um, the by learning from the, the for-profit world, from the corporate sector, bringing in new ideas, um, testing rigorously. And um, the traditional problem with mine clearing is it was done with humans with a metal detector, and it's painstakingly slow, because anywhere where there are mines, there also tend to be old AK-47 shells, old nails, and any time you find any metal, you have to stop and so painstakingly brush away the soil. Um, the rats, though, don't respond to the metal, they respond to the, to the scent of explosive. And so uh, a human deminer can clear about 20 square meters a day. My rat can clear 250 square meters a day. And my rat works for bananas. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, so one, I think one, one thing that we're seeing is this burst of innovation. Uh, we're also seeing that, I think, in a certain amount of collaboration between the for-profit and non-profit sectors. You know, in the past, there was this tendency to think, 
uh, nonprofit, uh, noble, worthy, uh, for profit, uh, evil, greedy. And I think increasingly there's a realization that what matters isn't your tax status, what matters is what impact you have. And there are some nonprofits that don't do much at all, and some for profits that can have a real uh, have a real impact. And we're also seeing, of course, hybrids, things like B corporations that are, uh, are double bottom line companies, impact investing, all these kinds of things that I think are bringing a burst of creativity uh, and a ferment into, uh, into, into this sector. And beyond the innovation, I think one of the most important things is a really increased sense of, um, of rigor in evaluating what works at what cost. To me, one of the most exciting things is uh, the introduction of randomized control trials where you can measure an intervention as if it were a pharmaceutical trial. Uh, and when you do that, you learn all kinds of interesting and sometimes challenging things. As you probably know, a few years ago, there was a lot of excitement about microfinance as a tool for development. When it was rigorously tested, it turned out that micro-lending, which is what we tend to think of as microfinance, that it helped, but frankly not as much as we had hoped. And it wasn't transformative, it was helpful. But in contrast to another element of microfinance, which tended to get less attention, micro-savings, helping people save small amounts of money, micro-savings really was transformative, but for women, but not for men, for reasons that we still don't fully understand. Um, and likewise, if you, know, if you read my work, you know that I tend to believe that education is the area where you really get the most leverage to change societies around the world. We tend to think intuitively the way you get more kids in an education system is you build more schools. There's actually, I mean, there are other ways that are more cost effective in getting more kids in school when you, when you test this out. And um, let me turn the tables on you. For anybody who hasn't read A Path of Tears, any guess that there's, in Kenya, they did some randomized control trials to look at what the most cost-effective uh, way it was of getting more kids into the school system. And there was one thing that really stood out. It was something we don't tend to think of as an education intervention. Uh, it's actually a pharmaceutical product. This would be a pharmaceutical product that would be in many of your houses, but that probably none of you or almost none of you have ever taken. How's that for a riddle? <laughs> Any guesses about what this might be, this, this, medica this medicine that um, very cheaply gets more kids into a school system in the developing world? Any guesses? I'll give you a hint. And if it's in, as I said, it would be in some of your homes, but it would not be intended for human consumption here in the U.S. It would probably be intended for your pet, for your dog or your cat. That's a really big hint. Deworming, yeah, exactly. Uh, we don't tend to think about deworming because our kids don't have intestinal parasites. Uh, but if you do have intestinal parasites, then the nutrition that you're taking in doesn't go to you, it goes to the worms, and you're much more likely to be anemic. And when you're anemic, you're more listless, you're more sick, you're missing school. Um, the Rockefeller Foundation dewormed American kids 100 years ago and it had this dramatic effect on their ability to study at that point. And it's incredibly cheap. This is what the metrics look like if you um, try to get a kid into the Kenyan school system by different methods. Um, bricks and mortar, $350 per pupil. Deworming, $3.50. And so the economists who did that study, then they started a group called Deworm the World to try to, to leverage this information uh, to, um, to make a difference uh, out there. And because these were based on rigorous randomized control trials, you tend to have more confidence uh, in them. People come to me all the time and suggest, you know, they want me to write about their great NGO, their great program somewhere. And my challenge is that, you know, it all sounds good and I can even visit a program and I, you know, bounce in and bounce out, but it's really hard for me to, to evaluate it carefully. Uh, when there is an outside evaluation, especially using this kind of a, uh, a randomized trial, then you have much greater confidence that this is something really powerful uh, and real. And it's not only in overseas uh, intervention, it's also, we're seeing this right here at home with domestic interventions. One of the things that turns out to be 
most powerful, I think, in creating opportunity here, has to do with the, the fact that in the US right now, 30% of teenage girls still get pregnant by age 19. 30%. American kids, uh, as far as we can tell, uh, don't have sex any more often than European kids, but they get pregnant and have babies three times as often. And that's not what they're planning to do. 70% of those teenage pregnancies are unplanned, but it's because in the US we don't have as good comprehensive sex education and we don't have as good access to long-acting reversible contraceptives. And when we, um, when we, uh, when there are randomized trials to try to provide that support to teenage girls who don't want to get pregnant, or to young women who don't want to get pregnant, then uh, you dramatically reduce the number of pregnancies, the numbers of abortions, and the number of births. And you save public money many times over. Um, a, uh, one, one LARC, one long acting reversible contraceptive costs about $5, uh, $500, lasts for years. Uh, in contrast, one uh, Medicaid childbirth costs $14,000. But traditionally, we're much more willing to fund the latter than the former. And I think in retrospect, speaking as a liberal, frankly, one of the things conservatives kind of basically got right was the importance of family structure as a way of addressing poverty and inequality. There's growing evidence that especially for boys at the margins, uh, outcomes are often not as good if there isn't a dad at home or some other male figure around. But likewise, the, uh, so while the diagnosis was right, the suggestions for how to address that from the conservative side have tended to, to fail. Uh, the programs about marriage promotion, uh, counseling, when they're carefully tested, they basically turn out not to work. What does seem to work to uh, promote strong families and strong marriages is in part just this, that if you can prevent a 16-year-old girl from having a baby so that she stays in school, so that she ends up uh, looking for a partner in her 20s rather than when she's 15 or 16, then she's much more likely to form that uh, strong family in which kids are going to have better outcomes. And um, so this is uh, one way of addressing uh, that, uh, that, that broader opportunity. Um, and I think one of the other things that emerges just overwhelmingly when you test interventions is the importance of intervening early. Uh, it's so much easier to help a troubled six-month-old or a troubled six-year-old than it is a troubled 16-year-old. And the evidence of uh, sometimes a lifelong cost of missing these early opportunities is just enormous. One of the, the most important public health gains in America, actually worldwide, in the last uh, quarter century was removing lead from gasoline. And the reason was that kids were routinely exposed in utero and in infancy to lead in ways that reduced their cognitive capacity. Uh, and so American kids have gained, on average, about 2.8 IQ points as a result. But so that has benefited your average kid considerably. In inner city housing in particular, though, there is still uh, lead paint chips, lead dust, and so more than 500,000 kids in the US, aged one to five, are still, still suffer lead poisoning in ways that harm their lifelong trajectory. And whatever programs you have for them as teenagers, you, they're never gonna be fully able to recover from that early harm. Uh, and um, and there, are many, there, there are many other uh, examples like that. The, um, there's a lot of discussion about inequality and, I mean, the figures are, are staggering. The one that always um, just blows my mind is the, uh, the, the, the last one that the Wall Street bonus pool each year is twice the collective annual earnings of all Americans working uh, full time at minimum wage. But we tend to think of inequality in terms of metrics of income or metrics of, of, of wealth. By far the greater kind of inequality, the inequality of opportunity. And 
that's also one maybe where we can get a little more traction. I sometimes wonder if liberals like myself shouldn't use the word inequality a little bit less and the word opportunity more. I wonder if opportunity isn't more of a bridge building term and that can help actually get things done. And certainly polls better. 97% uh, of Americans say that they believe in more equal opportunity early in life. 97%. Now, 97% 97 of Americans don't agree that the world is round. So uh, the idea that 97% of Americans agree on something I think is, uh, is really powerful. And the question is just whether one can get it you know, one step farther. Um, you know, what does that mean in practice? This is a uh, child I met in West Virginia, Johnny, four years old, he can't speak. Why can't he speak? Uh, he had um, hearing uh, impairments that weren't detected. What happened was his, his mom uh, had wanted to uh, breastfeed Johnny. Uh, she had trouble. The county had just cut out their lactation consultant as a cost-cutting move. Uh, she finally gave up. Uh, Bottle-fed babies are seven times as likely to have ear infections. In a middle-class house, that's not a problem. You have good access to a pediatrician. Um, they're, uh, for reasons that are somewhat unclear, uh, she either didn't take Johnny often enough to the pediatrician or the pediatrician did not notice the ear infections. And uh, so finally saved the children, did a hearing screening, and found that he was completely deaf in one ear and partly deaf in the other. And at that point, it was quite easy to, to treat the hearing problems. But his brain had been developing all this time without getting any auditory stimulation. And so it's not clear that he will ever fully recover the capacity to, uh, to, to speak. Decades from now, he may be limited in his capacity to to fully participate in American society and economy because we dropped the ball when he was a baby with something as simple and basic as a hearing screening. And one can say that his mom should have done a better job and should have ensured that he was hearing, and that's probably true. But as a society, when we also can institute hearing screenings and make sure that kids do get checked, then we're dropping the ball, too, in ways that will affect uh, Johnny for the rest of his life. And it is clear that when you do help kids get an equal start, uh, then it's sometimes astonishing what they can achieve. One of the, the places we write about in A Path of Tears is um, a school in a slum in Kenya, Kibera slum. It was uh, it's a school for girls. It was founded by a young man who actually grew up in Kibera, uh, Kennedy Odede, and got no formal education, uh, was homeless much of his childhood, but a brilliant, charismatic kid. Uh, at one point, he uh, applied to, to Wesleyan University to study as an undergraduate. He had no TOEFL, no SATs, no high school, no grade school, no nothing. Wesleyan took him to their great credit, and he graduated as their commencement speaker, uh, went back, uh, and started this Cabrera School for Girls. Um, and because they start with these kids, with these girls very, very early, see the, the impact they have. I want to show you a video of a girl there named Eunice, who, um, is uh, giving a poem that, uh, that she wrote herself. Um, and, and so to see where these kids are headed. Unisa Club presents my dream. Welcome. I have a dream, a dream that will never fail. Every mighty king was once a crime baby. Every great tree was once a tiny seed. And so is my dream. This journey seems so long, yet, I will not ever. The path has stones all over, but I will not give up. Every day of my life is a page of my history. Every step that I take is a move to my glorious destiny. It's not where I am, but where I'm going that matters. Now listen. Listen carefully to the words of wisdom. Stop what
watching your dreams go down the drain. Fight, fight, fearlessly, like a wounded lion. For it's not about who you are, but try to see yourself. So, dream. Isn't Eunice awesome? <laughs> yeah, she's truly uh, extraordinary. And you see that, you know, the when kids are nurtured early, early on to the what, what the impact can be. And, and one of the things I always wonder about is given the evidence of the opportunity that we can create with some of these interventions and the fact that sometimes they will actually save public money several times over, then why we don't invest in them more. And I've come to the conclusion that one of the impediments to doing that, both at the public level and at the private level, has to do with what you might call the empathy gap. And what do I mean by the empathy gap? One way of looking at it is that in America right now, the wealthiest 20% of Americans actually donate significantly less to charity than the, as a percentage of incomes than the poorest 20% of Americans. Why would that be? Affluent Americans aren't inherently any less uh, empathetic, any less compassionate, any less good than poor Americans. The answer seems to be that if you are affluent in America today, then to some degree you're insulated from need. You live in a nice neighborhood. Uh, most of your friends and acquaintances are reasonably well off, so that you're intellectually aware of need, but it's not something that, that in, you encounter daily. In contrast, if you are poor in America today, then every day you encounter people needier than yourself. And confronted by that, you reach in your pocket and you help out, even though you don't get any tax benefit because you're not itemizing your deductions. And so the poorest 20% of Americans actually donate almost twice as much as a fraction of income to charity as the most affluent Americans. But it's not just the donations. It's also, I think, the narratives about disadvantage that we come up with in our minds as reasons for society not to help that is one of the, the, the dangers. It's one of the reasons why it's so important to address this empathy gap. And, you know, in particular, uh, we've all heard the narrative of personal irresponsibility. And let's be blunt. There are elements of truth to this. There is no doubt that there are plenty of folks who are irresponsible in ways that compound disadvantage, compound poverty. And yet, there's also been growing research that shows it's a lot more complicated than it seems in all kinds of ways. Uh, one of the one line of research has shown, again, the, the long-term consequences of, of, of early childhood. Um, that if you, when you face stress as, a, as an infant, then the brain produces a stress hormone, cortisol. A little bit of cortisol now and then is good for you. It um, puts you on edge. Uh, if your brain is constantly bathed in cortisol in infancy because your, con your house, your, your home is constantly in stress, then it changes the architecture of your brain in ways you can actually see in a scan to prepare you for a life of challenge, a life of danger. It puts you on a fight or flight response that is on a hair trigger. Uh, it makes you constantly alert to perils. And the upshot is that, you know, in, in, in a classroom, you're less able to focus on what is on the blackboard because you've been evolved to also be paying attention to what's going on behind you. Um, you're on this hair trigger fight or flight response as well. And the second thing that we've learned um, that partly accounts for, for self-destructive behaviors is that when you are facing uh, uh, challenges, economic or otherwise, that saps bandwidth, that saps discipline, that uh, changes your time horizon for decision making. Some of the studies on this have been done on university campuses. Typically, they involve students coming in. Some are randomly assigned to imagine a large car repair bill, and others uh, are assigned to imagine something, something else. Um, 
and then at the end of the experiment, when the students are walking out, there, you know, there are some carrot sticks and also donuts. And those who are randomly assigned to imagine the car repair bill, they're the ones grabbing the donuts. Um, they are also asked if they want to be paid you know, now or paid a larger sum in two weeks. And again, if you were told to imagine the car repair bill, just this brief you know, thing that is completely imaginary, then you still, uh, your time horizon is scrunched and you want to be paid now. And so I think that's part of the explanation as well. And, and we're also learning that one way of breaking this cycle is to give people a sense of hope to, um, that, that I think there is growing evidence, one reason why a lot of interventions at home or abroad work is not precisely the nature of that intervention, but because it gives people a sense that they can have a better outcome, that they can have a better trajectory uh, if they work toward it. Um, and I think the, another way in which this narrative of irresponsibility and the, um, and, and the empathy gap come into play uh, has to do with race and ethnicity. Um, there, it becomes, there's a very human tendency to otherize people of a different race or of a different ethnicity and uh, to be suspicious of them. Uh, and the, uh, to me, the, the great challenge is not um, the you know, traditional old-fashioned racists wearing white robes uh, who believe in, in, in inequality. Rather, it's well-meaning people who intellectually believe in equality and yet behave in ways that perpetuate bias and discrimination. And that, again, is a, this notion of unconscious bias is something that I think runs deep in, in, in human beings, in all of us. I'm sure some of you have taken the implicit association tests, um, which are sort of fascinating. You can take them on race, on gender, on age, and it turns out that essentially we all have these unconscious biases that we act on. One of the studies that I found most fascinating was the uh, looked at um, NBA refs by several economists, and they found that in the NBA, professional refs, incredibly rigorously trained on television, dealing, you know, having to monitor every step of the way, that those refs were more likely to call personal fouls on players of a different race. Uh, somebody looked at baseball umpires, the same turned to be turned out to be true. And you think that if that is happening with NBA refs or Major League Baseball umpires, then imagine what is happening with a, a principal who's not being monitored, who gets two kids hauled into his office, you know, one white, one black, and is trying to sort out their competing stories and is trying to figure out who to suspend or not. Uh, you think about a, a police officer who's trying to make judgments about who to stop or not. Uh, you think about employers making decisions about who to hire or promote. One of the, uh, one of the, the, the studies on this sent out resumes that were exactly the same, but some had a name that sounded white, and others had a name that sounded African American. And the same resume with a white name got many more callbacks and was in fact equivalent to eight more years of job experience. And I'm sure that those uh, personnel folks going through the resumes, if you'd asked them, they entirely believed in racial equality. They, they would have been appalled by discrimination, and yet they were practicing it. And one of the things, though, that I think is a little bit reassuring is that after that NBA study that I mentioned, uh, the NBA was frankly outraged at the idea that its refs were, were calling fouls uh, based in partly on racial criteria. They were furious, they denounced the study, they did their own um, kind of somewhat bogus research showing that this was not an issue, but it was hugely aired. And so then a few years later, there was a follow-up uh, study using the same methods as the first study and it found that actually this racial bias in, in uh, personal fouls had disappeared. 
And it seemed to be that once you talked about it, once refs were aware of it, that actually that, that bias in application disappeared. And I think that's a promising sign that you know, race is hard to talk about. And especially race in the context of issues of disadvantage or poverty or opportunity. But I think if we can have some of these difficult conversations, then bit by bit we can chip away at the ways in which race or ethnicity or religion tend to block our willingness to, 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 to try to bridge that, that empathy gap. And when we do, it's sometimes remarkable what can be achieved. One of, one of our uh, favorite stories from a path of peers involved somebody who took that kind of a leap. It involved a, um, it starts with a young African-American uh, kid growing up in rural Arkansas in the late 1950s. He's, um, his name is Ollie Neal, really smart kid, but he's also kind of a troublemaker. He gets fired from his job at a local store for shoplifting. He's um, loud mouth in school. Uh, the, he reduces the sort of saintly librarian at his uh, school uh, to tears. And um, then one day, Ollie is um, uh, skipping an English class. He's in Mrs. Grady's little library. And he's browsing the books idly. He's not a reader, because he's a tough kid. Tough kids don't read books. But one book catches his eye. Uh, actually, Ollie explains to me later that the reason this novel catches his eye is because the cover shows this woman with what he describes as a very risque top. And I've always kind of wondered about that, because this is 1957. What does a risque top even mean in 1957, you know? But <laughs> it, it catches his eye. He looks at it, and then he thinks, oh, maybe he should check it out. And then he looks over at the checkout counter, and there's a girl in his class. Well, he's, he can't be seen reading a book. That would be humiliating. So he takes the book, and he puts it under his jacket, and he walks out. He steals the book. Well, he reads it at home. It's kind of the first novel he's read for pleasure. And it's a great read. It's by an African-American author named Frank Yerby. It's just a great novel. And he, a page turner, he really enjoys it, to his surprise. He returns it a week or two later, puts it back on the shelf, and he notices there's another novel by Frank Yerby. So he steals that one. <laughs> he takes it home again. It's just a great read. He eventually returns it. He notices there's a third Frank Yerby novel he hadn't seen before. He steals that one. Um, this happens one more time as well, four times in all. It turns Ollie Neal into a reader. He uh, graduates uh, to more literary fiction, to current events. And from this uh, rural, segregated, black high school in the middle of nowhere in Arkansas, he goes on to college. In college, he goes on to law school. He becomes one of Arkansas's first African-American lawyers, a leader in the civil rights movement, um, a prosecutor and a judge. Uh, that's Judge Ollie Neal. And throughout his career, he's very much devoted to helping disadvantaged kids like the one that he had once been. And he goes back to one of his high school reunions. He sits down with Mrs. Grady. And he says, Mrs. Grady, it's your little library that, that just completely turned my life around. But I got a confession. I stole some of your books. And Mrs. Grady says, well, Ollie, I have a confession too. I saw you steal that first book. And she explained that she'd been really indignant at him. You know, she was saying, what is this jerk doing now stealing books? And she was about ready to walk over and confront him and yell at him, when in this flash of empathy, she understood that he was embarrassed to be seen checking out a book. And so even though he's an obnoxious jerk who had made her cry, she lets him steal the book. And then in hopes that maybe it'll resonate with him, maybe he'll want to read something else, that weekend she drives 70 miles to Memphis to the used bookstores there to try to find another book by Frank Yerby. The first store doesn't have one. The second doesn't have one. She can't remember if it's the third or the fourth that does. She buys it with her own dime, drives back, puts it on the shelf, and when Ollie Neal steals that second Frank Gerby novel, she is thrilled. <laughs> then she drives back to Memphis, buys another one, 
and you know, does this several more times. And I think any of you who are engaged in these efforts, wrestling with inequity, with disadvantage, with poverty, you know that helping people is so much harder than it looks. And you can take a risk on people, and you think it's going to work, and then you get your heart broken. It happens. But every now and then, if we can bridge that empathy gap, as Mrs. Grady did, sometimes on people who don't entirely deserve it, that can have these remarkable impacts, uh, ripple, uh, not only on them, but rippling through them into the lives of so many others uh, as well. I think that one of the other impediments on these kinds of issues, aside from kind of ginning up the empathy in society to care, to want to make a difference, to try to equalize opportunity to some degree, one of the challenges is a feeling that problems are inevitable, we're hopeless, or are just too vast to make a difference. That anything we do is just going to be uh, a drop in the bucket. And in a sense, there's something to that. You know, um, these problems are vast. They're difficult. They're complicated. Um, I, you know, I mentioned lead. We can do lead abatement here or there, uh, but it's you know, 500,000 kids with lead poisoning. It's not something we're going to solve overnight. What we do is going to be, in a sense, a drop in the bucket. But I'm sort of a believer in drops in the bucket. Um, partly that's because of, uh, of this person, uh, Vladislav Stravovich, uh, a World War II refugee. Um, he was uh, uh, locked up for a while on a camp in a concentration camp in Yugoslavia, managed to get out uh, through Italy to uh, France, uh, was, could not get a labor permit in France, so he was just working at the margins. Um, feared that in France he would never be fully accepted as a refugee. Um, neither he nor his yet unborn children would really be a part of French society. So we began to think, how could he get to the U.S.? He explored uh, fake marriage with an American citizen. He kind of had that worked out with an American woman, and then it fell through. Uh, then he, though, was illegally cleaning hotel rooms, in Paris, and one of the rooms that he was cleaning was used in a summer by a young American woman working for the Marshall Plan, and she admired him. She thought he was smart. She convinced her parents back in uh, in the U.S., back in Portland, Oregon, and their church to sponsor his way to come to the U.S. They didn't know him. It was a complete risk. It didn't solve the global refugee problem at all. It didn't make a dent in the global refugee problem. It was one tiny drop in a huge bucket. Uh, but it was completely transformative for him. He, he was able to come to the US. Uh, he um, learned English. He uh, decided quickly that his name, Vladislav Shostakovich, was not a well-suited name for America. It had three Z's in his last name alone. Uh, and so he shortened Kristofovich to Kristoff. It's my dad. So take it from me. Drops in the bucket. That is how you fill buckets. Thank you very much. I'll be signing books here. Thanks a lot.